but I know you're all here for the presentation tonight on the Border Route Trail and the history of the Border Route Trail. The 65 mile Border Route Trail is kind of the crown jewel of the North Country Trail, but it's also a big deal to Minnesota Rovers because the Rovers built the trail in the 70s. And today the Border Route Trail Association and the Rovers maintain the trail. Um, you heard a lot of, a lot of uh, trail maintenance trips being posted uh, we usually do that in the spring and the fall. So this is the story of how it was created and what the future plans are for trail building. And Bob is also going to be talking about uh, showcasing 25 different day hikes that you could do in the area. Our presenter, Bob Jarvis, joined the Rovers in 1970 for the first time. He's the Rover archivist and he's the Border Out Trail Association liaison to the board. And he's our database director, and he's been involved with the Rovers Trails programs from the very beginning. And in recent years, he's been coordinating uh, really cool trips like the annual Rover Canal Boat hiking trip in Great Britain and the trips to Death Valley. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob to tell us all about the Border Route Trail. Okay, thank you, Fran. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to share my screen and start a slideshow here. All right. Okay, so let's start with a, uh, a quick introduction to the Border Route Trail. Can everyone hear me okay and see the slides and all? Is that good? Okay. <laughs> So, it's a, uh, the trail is located in northern Minnesota. It's very close to the Canadian border. It's a 65 mile long wilderness hiking trail between the main access points at Gunflint Lake and Otter Lake. And it parallels the Voyager border chain of lakes and connects with both the Kekakabic Trail and the Superior Hiking Trails. As you can see on the map here, the uh, the West Trailhead is located about 50 miles northwest of Grand Marais near the Gunflint Lodge on the Gunflint Trail. And the East Trailhead is located near Otter Lake, about 15 miles from Hoveland. And it was built by the Minnesota Rovers in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, due to uh, legislation in Congress, it's part of the nation's longest hiking trail, which is the North Country Trail. And the North Country Trail runs for 4,800 miles through eight different states, starting in the middle of North Dakota and running into uh, Vermont. So scenery, solitude, and a true wilderness experience are the best reasons to hike on this trail. Well, how did it all get started? Let's set our Wayback Machine to the fall of 1970. Like many other Rover adventures, this one started over a few beers in the basement of Gibbs Avenue, which is Ed Solstad's house near the St. Paul campus. Chuck Callender, Nate Flesness, Paul Scobie, and some other Rovers were poring over some old topo maps of the Eagle Mountain in the BWCA. It's the highest point in Minnesota and it was well known to rovers and even the site of occasional winter camping trips. In addition to the Eagle Mountain Trail, they also discovered on the map what appeared to be an abandoned trail running northwest from the base of Eagle Mountain, another six miles to Brule Lake. After consultation with the U.S. Forest Service, this led to the first ever rover trail clearing trip in the spring of 1971. By that fall, rovers completed the upgrade of the Eagle Mountain Trail. And it was a lot of work, but the view was well worth it. We also restored the Lost Brule Lake Trail. After the success of the Eagle Mountain and Brule Lake Trails, we approached the Forest Service looking for more trail building opportunities. 
the Superior National Forest had conceived of an idea for a hiking trail between the Gunflint Lake and McFarland Lake in part to take some of the uh, usage load off of the lakes, which were of course very popular for canoeing and still are. And so we started building the trail in 1972 on the western end in the area of Gunflint Lake, Loon Lake, South Lake, and Clearwater Lake. So new trail construction is very different from restoring existing trails. We can't just grab our chainsaws and head off into the woods. Once we've got a general idea of the overall route, we need to make decisions as to which iconic scenic sites should be included on the trail. It's not an easy decision, as this part of Minnesota teems with dramatic cliffs, woodland streams, waterfalls, and placid lake shores. And even the occasional friendly local. Natural beauty is what this trail is all about. And in between the grand scenic vistas, let's not forget the little things that make walking in the woods so worthwhile. Moss, lichens, and fungi each have their own charms. And all of them change with the seasons. Wherever you go, there's something new to see all the time. Our first step was to send out scouting expeditions. This is from one of our trips to the Rose Lake Cliffs area before construction even began. Should an overlook or viewpoint be included along the main line of the trail or should we construct a spur instead? Only boots on the ground can tell you this. People doing through hikes will want to camp along the way so the trail needs to access campsites as well. After we decide what viewpoints and campsites to include and how easy they are to get to, it's back to the maps to lay out a specific corridor. Should we pick up the northernmost ridge, the middle one, or the southern one? Because they all go in the right direction. Taking all these factors into consideration, we arrive at our final alignment. We sent out layout teams of two or three people to walk the proposed route and put up temporary blue plastic tape markers to guide the clearing crews. The person in front scouts ahead a few hundred feet so that we can avoid major obstacles and run the trail in as straight a line as possible. Finally, it's time to head into the woods and start clearing, but first we have to get ourselves and our gear to the trailhead. Over the years, we've used many different modes of transportation. This is a 1948 Greyhound luxury model formerly owned by John Elliott that was used for trail clearing trips in the early 80s. Some parts of the trail are easier to get to by motorboat. Or even canoe for sections inside the BWCA. Other access points are conveniently located near roads. Finally, we start the actual clearing process. In the beginning, we had relatively primitive tools, such as a machete or woodsman's pal shown here, Sven saws, and a David Bradley chainsaw that weighed over 35 pounds and required a special frame pack modified with a heavy metal baking sheet to carry it. While some folks have the fun of running chainsaws and brush cutters, others walk behind the machines to clear logs and brush from the trail.
little brushing makes a huge difference. This shows the before and after of the section that you just saw in clearing. We worked hard, but there was always time to take a break for lunch, have a little rest, and even have a bit of fun along the way. Of course, it's not all just a walk in the woods. There are streams, swamps, and beaver ponds to cross. In the beginning, we use local materials and a lot of ingenuity to build bridges and boardwalks. This is a seven minute Super 8 movie about the construction of the original bridge over the Portage Brook. It's silent, by the way, so don't expect any sound on it. So here's the intrepid crew on their way into the woods with all their gear. Here people are cutting down actual solid trees that uh, are going to be used as a, for constructing various parts of the bridge. So this is something we don't normally do anymore. It's actually cutting down live timber or standing timber even. Hey, Bob, if you could name some of these people once in a while, if it's convenient, that would be great. Some of them are listed in the credits at the end, but we've got uh, Gary Carlson, Ed Solstad, uh, Andy Knapp. I just don't recognize them. They're not gray enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, we all had more hair and darker hair back then, that's for sure. Jeff Harrison? I don't think he was on any of these. Okay. I was not on this particular one. This movie was shot by Omar. Judy Judy Peterson? She was uh, she was on some of them, but not this particular one. Poppy Benson is on this one. Cheryl Soshnik? Uh, I don't think she was on this one. There's a, okay. several people I don't recognize here. So. Andy Knapp? Andy Knapp's there, yeah. Poppy, I think, is the one with the uh, pigtails. This was our our first bridge. Later, we got uh, genuine saw cut timber and this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll see pictures of the modern bridge later on. But this is this was the original one over Portage Brook, and as you can see, it's quite a lot harder hauling these large timbers that have to go all the way across the creek. Much, much heavier than the metal piping and things that we use now. I think that's Andy Knapp on the left there, the long beard. So you see, kind of see as, as it goes on that they started out by putting two 
larger trees that were actually long enough to go completely across the stream and using that as the as, as the main support members for the whole bridge As you can see there, they're moving some pretty, pretty big chunks of timber there. Quite a big, quite a bit of work to slide those things across. So you're using some smaller bits as uh, rollers to move the bigger logs across. Any notable injuries during any of these trips? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think. Uh, Amazingly uh, enough, not so. <laughs> <laughs> even even back then, we were pretty concerned with safety. You notice that on most of the scenes, uh, everybody's wearing helmets, and people who are running machinery are wearing chaps. Well, it doesn't surprise me to see Andy in the water taking a vulnerable spot. Bob, can you explain what they're doing for those of us who have no idea? Well, they're uh, basically cut three or four logs that were quite large, as you can see in there. They had to be big enough to go all the way across the stream. Fortunately, it's not that big a stream, but those are the main members that hold everything else up. And you notice they're, uh, so they're using those that's the basis for the bridge, and then you notice they were pounding uh, stakes into the riverbed there to, uh, oh, and here's the completed bridge, and here's uh, Omar coming across with his pack to show what it will look like in actual use. So I was, I was having fun with my uh, movie program. Macintosh playing with those titles and things. In 1975, the Rovers began receiving funding from the Minnesota DNR Ski Touring Grant and Aid Program. And uh, that allowed us to upgrade the trail that was existing to single track ski touring standards and also to, uh, to create the new trails as that we were doing to ski touring standards like the magnetic trail and the other connecting trails that we put in and uh, nowadays and then back then the rovers work with the Hestons and Gunflint Lodges and other businesses up in the Gunflint area the resorts and uh, help them create a network of loop ski trails near the resorts so our partnership with the lodges and resorts in the in the Gunflint area was really the beginning of a beautiful friendship 
the resorts provide us with lodging in cabins and bunkhouses, uh, motorboats, and sometimes even home-cooked meals. And in return, we build and maintain local loop trails that their customers can use for hiking, snowshoeing, and skiing. Because of the DNR grant, we were able to upgrade existing hiking and access trails to ski terrain standards, like this one to Magnetic Rock. Those log bridges can be a little tricky on skis. By this time, our technology had improved. Machetes were replaced by brush cutters. And chainsaws became smaller and lighter and more reliable. Of course, technology has its downside, too. Chains need to be swapped out as they get dull, and someone has to schlep the fuel through the woods. Many enduring friendships and long-term relationships were built along with the trail. The main line of the Border Route Trail was substantially complete by 1981. And to mark the occasion, we had a, rib uh, a ribbon-cutting ceremony. Excuse me using a brush cutter, of course. But as the saying goes, the project isn't over till the paperwork is done. In our case, that means adding signs, measuring and mapping the trail, and installing information kiosks. We also published a trail guide and maps for the benefit of hikers, and it's now in its eighth edition. Of course, the trail is never really done. Mother Nature is constantly trying to reclaim it. Spring floods wash out bridges and boardwalks. And the replacement bridges are constructed of metal pipe and treated lumber. The materials need to be carried in on foot or dragged in by snowmobile in the winter. Trails are also affected by major natural disasters like the derecho of 99, or the Ham Lake Fire of 2007, which actually burned out part of the BRT before, between the Gunflint and Loon Lake on the western end of the trail. We were up on uh, one of the cliffs uh, watching the uh, plane scoop up water and dump it. <laughs> Did a number on some of our signs. And just last October, an unprecedented tornado took out a section of the trail in the BWCA. Let's talk a bit about how the trail is maintained and what you can expect when you go on a trail clearing trip. So it was the first long backcountry hiking trail built by volunteers in Minnesota. And uh, currently, volunteers from the Border Route Trail Association maintain the trail with assistance from the US Forest Service and the Minnesota DNR. And so we spun off the Border Route Trail Association to be a 503C Organize, non-profit organization, and, uh, but we still work very closely with rovers. 
Most of our trips are in the spring and fall when the weather is cooler and there are fewer bugs. If you're working on the eastern end of the trail or within the wilderness area, you'll be staying in, primitive campsite, in a primitive campsite like this one at Otter Lake. It has a pit toilet, a cleared area for tents, and a fire ring. The water is carried from the lake and boiled before use. If you're working in the wilderness area of the trail, you'll be using hand tools such as bow saws, crosscut saws, and loppers. In order to use a crosscut saw or a chainsaw on the trail, you'll need a certification from the U.S. Forest Service. And the BRTA coordinates and subsidizes certification classes, which usually happen once a year. If you're working on the Gunflint Lake end of the trail, you'll often stay in a bunkhouse or comfortable cabin like this one at Heston's Resort. Whether you're camping or staying in a cabin, you can count on good food and plenty of it. There are different ways to hike the Border Route Trail. So you have to figure out your logistics. Do you want to do a loop hike or a through hike? Uh, if you're doing a through hike, you need to think about arranging a shuttle yourself if you have a large enough group, using an outfitter to shuttle your vehicle, or splitting your group into two parts and swapping your keys in the middle. It normally takes four to six days with a pack, and you won't be able to cover as many miles as fast as you normally do on other trails because it is a fairly uh, rough trail through rugged terrain. Spring and fall are the best because of the uh, lack of bugs and the vegetation won't be as thick. And we strongly suggest of course that you have some sort of a GPS device and also as a backup using paper maps and compass. If you're hiking within the uh, boundary waters, uh, you need, do need to get permits from the uh, U.S. Forest Service to do that. The BRTA website has a list of 25 day hikes that you can download from the maps page. So this is if you want to do it in chunks and not uh, you're not ready to commit to a full uh, through hike. On the western end, the Magnetic Rock Trail makes a great day hike. And the Bryce Brione Trail and the Bridal Falls are another good option in this area. The Moss Lake Trail is our most recent addition, and this allows us to do a 13 mile loop going to the Rose Lake Cliffs, which are probably the most dramatic overlooks on the whole uh, border route trail. The eastern end, eastern end of the BRT is also known for its overlooks. So join us on the BRT, where all the women are strong, the men are good looking, and the chainsaws are all above average. So now I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian Hansen, who's the president of the Border Route Trail Association, to talk about the current trail conditions and upcoming trail clearing events. All right, take it away, Brian. Here are highlights from last year. We had a really good year on the wilderness section. The, 35 mile, uh, the 36 miles, we cleared over 17 miles of trail. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's huge. With a, a typical crew can do about um, uh, two or three miles a weekend, a crew of seven or eight people. Non-wilderness side was even a uh, bigger success. We did all 29 miles on two trips, uh, 
we did trips in the fall and in the spring. Um, every every part, section of the the mechanized or then the wilderness was cleared, so it's in uh, really good shape. However, on, uh, uh, Bob alluded to that uh, on October 10th, we had a, um, that tornado touchdown in uh, northern Minnesota. It was the first tornado warning ever in Cook County in October. It was a surprise to most people. Um, <clears throat> this here is kind of a shot. If you can see it, it, it's touched down near Alder Rocky Lake and went straight north about four miles. And this sections were almost uh, 500 yards wide. This is a, a satellite view. You can actually see the damage. Here's a, here's a map. And you can kind of, this is Clearwater Lodge is right here. Clearwater Lake is here. It's about, this lake is about seven miles long. And the tornado went right across here, went north, crossed Clearwater. There's a portage here, the Clearwater to Mountain Portage. And, um, and the damage went about a half a mile to the east of that portage and about 1.3 to the west. So it went up the hill to the top. That's the most damage. And then going west, it was a little less, but still, still are trees or branches down. Here's an, here's an aerial view. You can see the, the if you look closely, it's comes, oh, I apologize the, because of the screen here, but there's, there are trees down. You can see all the damage done. Clearwater Lake going north. You can see it was a, a F2 tornado, estimated 120 mile an hour winds. Here are some photos of the damage that was, uh, Bob Westfall took these like the, Within a week after this happened, he was up there and you can see root balls pulled up, trees down across the trail. Trees crisscrossing across the trail. You can't even can't even see the tread. And then unfortunate thing was we had a crew in here with a uh, MCC and I, CCM and I crew had just cleared this a month before this. And it was just a, a well cleared trail and then this damage happened. So Here's another one with the trees down. Now this, um, this is probably something more than what our typical volunteers could do. There's a lot of energy behind these trees as they're pulled down and the, and the root balls and such. So the Forest Service is gonna bring in a crew early this spring, hopefully as soon as the, the, uh, the snow is gone and the ice is off the lakes, because really the only way to get there is to paddle in. And um, they'll, they'll begin their, their clearing out, cutting through, and then we're going to use the volunteers who'll help mop up and uh, clear out the, um, the loose branches and, uh, and uh, logs and such. That's a motorized lake, isn't it, or Clearwater? Yeah. Clearwater, I believe it's uh, up to 25 horse. There's, there's yeah. one landing in the far west end. Yeah, I've been there a and, few times. Yeah, yeah. Mm. but it's, again, it's, it's down in the far almost to the far east end is where the where we have to paddle to or, or mortar to. We're trying to get um, uh, either a forest service or maybe one of the um, the resorts to, to help us out, but they, that can get kind of costly. So take us down with motor boats. Here's another shot of the trees down over the tread and up high above. There's some more. to the big blow. Excuse me? Of July. Yeah, yeah, I was a, uh, Again, 1.3 miles going west. So here are some of our, the trips that are scheduled for this spring. This kind of gives you a snapshot that we have at least four uh, wilderness trips scheduled. And these are the, the sections where they're, they're um, uh, where we're gonna clear around uh, Crab Lake, South Lake. This is South Lake Trail to Mucker, Pine Lake. Then we've got a couple uh, mechanized trips scheduled too with a, the, the, the west end and also the east end. Here are the dates. Um, I'm going to show you the link. I'm going to give you the links to where you can look for these on the Border Out Trail website and also on the uh, Border Out Trail meetup site. And you can get to these sites just off from our uh, the rover the rover website too. So this kind of tells us that the, these trips typically depart from the Twin Cities on this first date and then re return on the second date. Um, the, the, uh, 
wilderness trips usually are pretty rigid. We all go in and out at the same time. We try to schedule the mechanized trip. So if, if, you, can only, if you can only make it a, a day or two, that, that's fine too, as long as you schedule it with the, the crew leader. Kind of give you an idea what mechanized trips, I think Bob talked about this a little bit. The mechanized is outside the water, water, uh, the water water's wilderness. So that's where power tools are, are um, able to be used. And that's, again, that's about 15 miles on one end of the boundary waters and 12 miles on the other end. So there's a section there that you can use chainsaws, handheld power uh, brush cutters. Uh, um, we have access to these walk behind power mowers or brush cutters called a, I guess we call them a billy goat. And that'll that'll clear out the, the brush and a lot of the, uh, the weeds and, and shrubs growing in and the uh, thimbleberries and such. Inside the boundary waters where you can't use power tools, we typically use uh, hand saws or silky saws. Sometimes we'll use crosscut uh, saws, hand loppers, and then ma manual brush cutters. And here, uh, Bob talked about that too. There is a, you have to be chainsaw and crosscut saw certified to be able to use those in the boundary waters. Uh, saw certification also first aid. We do have some saw, um, saw training coming up here at uh, Bunker Hills in Andover, coming up here um, April 23rd and 24th. And it's an all day session. Saturday is the, is the chainsaw, Sunday is the cro cross cut. You don't have to take them both. You can take just the chainsaw if you'd like, or just the cross cut. Um, if you wanna sign up, you go to our Border Route Trail website and here it's described here, borderoutetrail.org or you can go to our um, the meetup. And if you can't, if you don't want to remember them or write them down, you can go to the, we have the links on the Rovers website too. There, um, one important thing to remember is before you take the train saw or the chainsaw or the cross cut, there, you have to be um, certified through the um, North Country Trail Association. There are some videos you need to watch and there's a couple of waivers to sign and such. And it's, Part of this training is you have to be first aid uh, certified too, and there'll, there'll, there will be some instruction there on how to um, how to get that first aid and CPR training. Again, if you for interest for um, information on the clearing trips, for dates, the schedules, the summary of the trip, what what you'd expect for lodging or meal plans and costs and such, check out the Border Route Trail um, website and also our um, the meetup site. On the, board, on the website, you just go to the trail clearing, schedule, and then on, for the wilderness to sign up, you have to go to the sign up page. For the mechanized trips, contact Gary, Gary, Gary Carlson. I think he's on, this, on the call here tonight. This is his, um, his email address, and that's, that's, also, that's in our, um, our website. He can give you, fill you in with any information you would need to, um, to participate in any of the the wilderness trips. Uh, the wilderness trips, I believe there's a nominal fee. I believe it's $25. And they typically provide the food, dinners, and I think breakfast. And you'd usually bring your own lunches. For the, the wilderness ones, just because of uh, uh, we're backpacking our own gear and food in, we typically bring our own food, our own backpacking gear. So there's no cost to those trips. You, you, you provide your own food. Um, again, any more info, any, uh, once more information on this, you can get the links to, to find our, um, the guidebook, uh, links to purchase the maps or any other information, check out the, um, the websites, the meetup, and also on Facebook. So anybody have any questions? I, th I believe as of this afternoon, there were eight, eight available spots in the chainsaw and crosscut training. Brian, I did post both the BRTA uh, website and the Rovers link. Great, great, yeah. thanks. thanks for doing that. And again, if you have uh, any interest in the trail, interest in participating or just want information about it, if you wanna do a hike, you're more than welcome to attend our monthly Border Out Trail board meetings. Um, 
we try to hold them uh, live now at Gary Carlson's house. Check our um, check out the um, our meetup site. That'll tell you when, when and where it is. So we'd be happy to have you join us and be part of this legacy uh, trail clearing group. I have one question about how often do you need to have cross cut saw training? If you haven't had it in the past, how long is it good for? I believe it is two years. Okay. Three years. I've got my card right here. So I'm one of those that card expired during COVID. So the forest service did extend it. So if, if you have a card that expired during the COVID uh, pandemic, um, they extended our certification till December of 2022. Um, so I'm good for the end of this uh, uh, trail clearing year, but I will I will need to get my training next next spring. Thank you. And even again, it's uh, it, it's it's quite educational. I mean, it's, you know, it's a safety course, but they really give you a lot of insight into how the, the physics behind, uh, you know, cutting up a tree or cutting up branches and such and how a chain works, how the chainsaw works and, uh, you know, the chainsaw and also the, the crosscut saw. So it's, uh, um, it's a really good experience. Bob, Brian, we have a question in the chat. Um, what is your sense of how the popularity of the BRTA has grown? in recent years or recent dec decades? Well, I've been involved with the Border Out Trail for only really about four or five years. Um, I, from my experience, popularity is about the same, probably getting a little more popular with as the improvements, you know, as we improve the trail, we've replaced a couple bridges here in the last couple of years, um, but still, it is remote. I, I hiked it with my daughter one year, Memorial Day weekend, and we bumped into maybe two people on the whole trail. You, you're there, you, you, you can hike all day long and maybe run into somebody. It's, it's remote. You, you want solitude, you want quiet. That's where you want to go hike. We have another question. Um, is it helpful to come if I'm not very strong? Um, we, you all have to remember that this is a volunteer. You're not getting paid. You, you take a break when you want. You do what you can. It's not like a, it's, it's not a work weekend. I mean, it is, it can get physical and it can be a workout, but it's uh, you just do what you can. Uh, there are a lot of small branches and things too. So you don't have to lug away the, tr the trunk of the trees. You know? <laughs> right. And then there's somebody always, somebody needs to carry a, uh, a chainsaw, uh, the fuel, or maybe a, a first aid kit or the, the, the um, um, tool kit. So it's not all, you typically we would, you know, carry that in a backpack, but um, yeah, it, it can be a workout. You sleep well at night. So Bob, all those uh, hikes that you pointed out in your presentation, are they on the BRTA website? Yes, there's there's a link on the uh, uh, trails page that, uh, or the maps page, I believe, down kind of down at the bottom. And it's a, it's a spreadsheet, basically. It's an Excel spreadsheet that lists all those 25 uh, day hikes that, uh, that we've come up with and where they start, where they end, how long they are and that sort of thing. Okay, Bob, so I've been to a couple of uh, primitive sites where the location of the la latrine has moved. And I'm wondering, is there a, a policy around that, you know, where they have to shift it every so often or when it's full or something like that? <laughs> You know, that, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. I think they do get moved once in a while, and there are certain restrictions as to how far away they have to be from water. 
you know, from the lake and how far away they need to be from the trail and that sort of thing. And, and in a lot of places, uh, as you've probably noticed, the bedrock on the board route trail is pretty not very deep, you know, and so there's, there's kind of limited places where you can put a latrine and dig a reasonable size hole because you're going to run into bedrock in a lot of places. I've always wondered that ever since I put a, in one of the songs that I wrote about rovers, I mentioned that you dug latrines and I thought, I wonder how often they have to be switched. So <laughs> thanks for satisfying that. Well, if you want some experience in that, um, we have two uh, campsites on the far east end that don't have latrines or or um, U.S. Forest Service uh, the fire grates, and they're gonna the Forest Service is gonna give us two latrines and two fire grates, and we're gonna install them hopefully sometime this next year. So I'm glad you volunteered to uh, to help out on that one. That's what I get for talking shit. <laughs> No pun intended, is it? <laughs> All right, as long as we're talking about that, I do know somebody, I, I don't know how they do, I don't know the math, but uh, they do measure. I had. I know someone that walked, had to, out on Superior Hiking Trail, do a survey and determine which ones were full enough to go, uh, have to be moved. So uh, there is some some science to that. Thanks. Are the facilities there kind of similar to the Boundary Waters campsites and uh, on the border route? Or I think the, I've only the, done one trail up there. So <laughs> the border route trail they they do share some with the canoeing campsites, but they're real similar. They have a, um, a like like we said a latrine and a um, fire grate. Of course the and there are some that are just exclusively for the trail the hikers, but they don't get the the use. That, that the canoeing ones do so. Mm -hmm. And unlike the canoeing, it, you have, you absolutely have to stay at a, um, a designated campsite when you're canoeing in the boundary waters. If you're backpacking and you get to a point where it's time to end for the day, and if that campsite is busy or, or if somebody's in it or you just can't get to the next one, you are allowed to um, stealth camp or camp you know, just in the, in the woods, in the wilderness, there are some regulations. You have to be so many feet from a, from the trail, so many feet from a, from a water source. Other than that, you can, uh, um, find a spot to set up your tent and make it through the night. Thanks. Thanks. So is there a connection? Questions? Is, there, is there a connection to the trail? I think you said at the beginning of the presentation to the uh, the trail that goes up. The, uh, God, I forgot the name of the trail that goes up from Duluth. Uh, you know, along the North Shore. Is the there the Superior Hiking Trail? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, is there a connection between those two? Or, yeah. Yes, there is. In fact, there's an overlap. There's a um, where the Superior Hiking Trail begins. It's called the 270 Overlook. It's it's uh. I think it's like a half a mile from the parking lot, the trailhead. And it overlooks the Pigeon River, and the va valley. And you can look, you know, you're looking out into Canada, into Ontario. Mm -hmm. And then the border out trail actually bypasses that and goes, all, or it goes right past that all the way down to the trailhead. So for that quarter of a mile, you're on both the, the uh, border out trail and the Superior Hiking Trail. Mm -hmm. and essentially, that's the point. That's the uh, mm -hmm. Otter Lake. 270 overlook is that connection. Yeah, I think the last time I did trail clearing, I had another question up near Heston's. We used, I thought we used mechanized tools, but as the, as the restriction or the rules changed since then, or no, no, no. In the in the area by Heston's, uh, you can use that's that's outside the boundary waters. That's uh, in the what we call the wilderness or the non or uh, excuse me the non wilderness or the mechanized section. So all the way from the the uh, make. Magnetic Rock Trailhead, past Gunflint and Heston's, all the way to the, the Bridal Falls. Just a, just a little ways past the Bridal Falls is where you'd hit the sign that tells you you're entering the Boundary Waters. So that whole section there is uh, um, 
the mechanized you can use you can use saws power tools yeah and rob had a question about danger on the we we were last time i did trail clearing we they at the forest there was a fire actually going on and the, so the forest service came over and said you guys want to uh, help out and so some of us went over there and helped helped on the fire and it was kind of interesting and uh and they said when we were done, he said, "Well, you got to go in that tent. You can't leave till you go in that tent." And uh, so we went in that tent, <laughs> and they paid us. So it was kind of cool. So <laughs> uh. I would have done it for free. But, you know, <laughs> almost take a dollar, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was interesting. Little danger there, Rob. So <laughs> uh. Actually, we just did supplies. We didn't do. You know, we weren't working on the fire itself. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, but. Well, there's obvious. You can see where the. Damage from fires, damage from uh, wind. Uh, you see that the trail, the, the forest is changing all the time from one year to the next. So I've only been on one trail clearing trip and enjoyed it. And uh, I got to tell you, as a rover, I take a lot of pride in the border route trail, despite my only two days of effort on it. And I really want to thank you, Bob, Ed, John. All you guys, it's a freaking amazing thing you guys have done, and we get to live in your legacy, and it's awesome. So everyone, if you can find in your reactions down below a thumbs up thing or a clap, show it. Show the love. <laughs> Thanks, John, for that cool uh, bus he had for a while there. That was <laughs> Florence the bus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we always had full trips <laughs> when we had the bus. Any other questions, uh, comments, reminiscences? Well, thank you, Bob. Um, well, thank you all, all of you that have been hiked the trail, that have helped maintain it, et cetera, et cetera help publicize it, couldn't do it without you. <laughs>